I'll thank, I'll thank you both of you for two fantastic uh, talks. Um, although they're very different uh, writers, and they, they cover very, very different themes, there is this line in the hand story, uh, which I don't, I, I don't claim to be able to quote verbatim, but it's, it, it's, it says this, essentially that the sort of the essence of Wings Will Bound, he was one of those characters whose essence, essence or, or even consciousness is not in, in his character, but in part of his elsewhere in the body, sort of distributed or diffused through his body. And it's almost like his consciousness, to, to bring it back to what uh, David was talking about, is actually in other parts. It's not in his, you know, in his soul or in his brain, but in the physical things, uh, physical sort of giveaways. And he's always trying to hide his hands in that story. Um, and he's uh, guiltily or, or otherwise. Um, and it's, it's a very physical thing. Consciousness is a very physical thing. And, it, and that, for me, is something which Lawrence does, particularly in uh, The Horse Dealer's Daughter. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of... The, the two characters who are, who are trying to reach each other, if you like, have to, have to break through and have to do something kind of physically very, very strange. And it's a purely... Uh, it's a it's a violent act, and you talk about consciousness as almost like a violent. But in the blind man, it's even worse because the man blinded in the war, he's waiting for his friend, and in the cow buyer where it's dark, he can feel his way around in the dark. And the friend, in the end, he, he wants him back as his friend, and he asks him to touch his to touch his eyes. He's very badly defaced and he's blind, and the man does it, but is himself actually broken by it. Was it supposed to be a breakthrough for the blind man to reconnect with what was there before the war? But the friend has to do it, it's more than he can bear. It's like the ordeal that Lawrence suggests, really, which I think harks back to... Um, um, it's one of the saint stories, the, 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 the ferryman, who actually has to embrace a leprous person, who turns out then to be Christ. So he presses the leper um, to, to, to him. And it, it, you know, he's, he's redeemed by the act, actually. But in the blind man story, and I think that what you're saying really with the hands as well, it's an intensely physical thing. And you, th th this is not an intellectual exercise. It's possible to talk about it as, a, <laughs> as, as something that we might try or not try, but actually in all the stories, and I take it in this one as well, it's, it's, the consciousness is in the body. And there's an there's amazing scene in the whole still sort of work. Um, the doctor just happens to look across a field and there is somebody kind of walking and it turns out it's one of the daughters uh, walking uh, into, into a pond almost without uh, it's an act of attempted suicide but it's, it's like a trance-like movement it's a, it's a phenomenon it's not a, um, it's not a deliberate uh, dis, you know, determined act in the same way that Wings Little Bones hands are have a mind of their own, entirely have a mind of their own. That's right. And then, then uh, right at the end, Ferguson goes into the water himself up to there and fishes her out and, and, <coughs> and, and revives her. But there's a very strange thing at the end. She said, I knew what I was doing. But she manifestly doesn't, on a conscious level, know what she's doing. And it's not certain that she knows that Ferguson is actually watching from the road. It seems very unlikely, actually. That, but it, on, on some deep level, it's this bid to get through to a life of her own by doing something which is on a level of consciousness. And very interestingly, at the end of that story, um, he's had to undress her, strip her, wrap her these filthy clothes, wrap her in a blanket. She wakes to the consciousness that she's naked <coughs> in a blanket. And then she said, who dressed me? And I said, I, I did. And she says, you love me. You love me. You love me. And she never once says she loves him. It's almost as though she doesn't need to. And he resists it. He resists this. This is like the touching of the eyes. He resists it, and then you can see it across her face she starts to falter in her faith that she's that it is true. And at that moment he can't bear it. It's, it's not out of pity for her, but that is what breaks through in his particular case. It's the sight of this woman's faith in herself, in, in her understanding that he loves her. And then, but then we know, and then the story sort of starts actually because they're, they're, that's the end of the story. But not. So you're right, I mean, there are these intensely, I mean, sort of, uh, well, eccentrically uh, physical things. Clearly, the order of chrysanthemums is, is much the same, where the miner is brought home and laid out to be washed by wife and uh, her mother. So.
and not to give the ending of Hands Away because it's such a beautiful mm -hmm. ending, but the final the final act uh, of that of that story is is not a it's not a, a determined act. It's 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 a ritual essentially, and uh, it's the hand performing a ritual that they've known almost kind of like from from muscle memory or from something, and it's not. It's an attempt to redeem himself, but do you see it as a as a failure to redeem himself? Do you, do you see it I, as a? I, I, I don't know whether Sherwood Anderson has any conception of what redemption really means. I don't think he's interested so much in redemption, um, which I think is interesting because redemption is something that um, most modern novels are almost a, 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 obsessed with. You know, yeah. redemption of characters and um, uh, a, a, an editor friend of mine. Um, told me once that, I asked her why she was so successful at the books that she published, and she said, um, if there's no redemption, there's done, I don't publish it. Um, so it's something that, that people look for, people want and, 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 miss, and, and, and need. Um, and I think that's maybe a process of our times, and our particular times in which we live at the moment. Um, uh, there's that, a, a need for, um, for something cocksure and, and, and absolutely certain that we're going to have something at the end of it and it will be re a, a redemption. But whereas I think with Sherwood Anderson, I don't think he's interested even slightly in whether Wings is innocent or guilty. I think he just is Wings. That's, that's who he is. And, or, or in this case, he could be Myers as well. Um, but he's interested in that holistic nature of, of, of consciousness and, 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 of, and of humanity where... Um, that is who he is. He is all of these diverse things, whether he's the hands, whether he is Myers, whether he is wings, whether he has hair or not has hair. You know, he, he just is exactly who he is. And I don't think um, Anderson has any perhaps moral imperative to make us see him in any other way. He does play with us, though. I mean, clearly, you know, fat little old man thing. Um, he is trying to get us to feel for him and then say, well, you know, maybe... You're not right to think about that. So he's getting us to think about perhaps when we see someone for the first time, what it is that we see. Do we see the hands or do we see the nature of someone's character or, 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 or what do we see? And can we trust any of that? So I don't think he's particularly interested in redemption, but I think he is interested in looking at that wider implications of, of how we get to know people and what we know when we actually do get to know someone. This, the way you describe redemption, I've never come across it like that before. I mean, I, I would detest that as much as I detest the idea of closure. I mean, <laughs> the idea that you could cocksuredly achieve redemption seems to me absolutely balmy. I mean, and none of these Lawrence stories do that at all. They open up on the possibility of a life worthy of the name. Mm -hmm. That's if that's redemption, then it's not actually because you, you're you rescue yourselves by force of of colossal risk. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the the essential thing is that these these people risk they risk a status quo which is which is in a sense tolerable and is only intolerable if you somewhere from somewhere or other have got an idea of a better way of being human and I think that goes back to your point about having something at stake and I think that's it's so often when you when you read things and it's like what's at stake here who's what you know and you just kind of it, it feels like it's playing at something without having that thing at stake, whether it's something tiny, teeny, tiny, or something huge. And I think that um, that, that, is, that, that is essential in, in any of those stories. And I think Lawrence has that and what's at stake with, with Wings. And in, in another, um, another story in, in the collection, which I didn't quite get time to talk about, was um, uh, The Untold Lie, which is an absolutely superb story, which is all about a moment where redemption is on offer and yet it's clutched from both sides. So there's two men at this perhaps like almost joycey kind of epiphany level at the middle of the story, not the end of the story, in the middle of the story. And then everything kind of collapses underneath that, uh, underneath the weight of what's happening there and their own responsibilities. And that kind of sense of redemption, there was something huge at stake. They're both of their kind of redemption from their lives. And yet at the end of it, Anderson refuses, refuses their kind of, their, their, um, to let them have that because it's not quite within their natures to, to get this kind of easy, for want of a word, closure on, on what's happened before in their lives. Yeah. This sort of feeds into um, a, a lot of theory and, and sort of critical writing about the short story generally. There's, uh, the writer Nadine Gordmer has talked about 
the, uh, the short story is offering an alternative sort of moral compass or, or moral version of the world to the novel because the novel, uh, whether it likes it or not, sort of builds up a, a cumulative sense of truth and therefore ties into this idea that truth is somehow an accumulation uh, of insight or revelation or knowledge or something. Whilst the short story gives you, uh, as a form, different, uh, just gives you sort of little glimmers, uh, fireflies, she calls them, in the darkness. And, and for a moment, you can sort of see perhaps uh, a pattern of a life in a small, in a small kind of incident, uh, or a seemingly small incident. But there's also even those tiny little discrete fragmentary truths are, are questionable. And I, I can't agree with you more about that story. First time I read Hans, uh, I thought, okay, right, he's a, he's a pedophile. Fair enough, he's just living with his guilt in this horrible, kind of drawn-out ceremony uh, of fidgeting and, and pacing them down and rosaries and everything else. Um, and then the second time, it's like, he hasn't done anything. And, it's, and each time you read it, you sort of, you go from one side to the other and you sort of, eventually, it settles into an, an ambiguity about his character. And the short story is surely better than the... Uh, the novel, or more suited to the novel, perhaps than, than that. Or you both write novels, so maybe you're in a position to. Well, I was thinking of, um, if I think of the the novels by Lawrence that I particularly love, like Women in Love, then the, even at the end of that, I mean, it ends. It ends. They break off a quarrel. That's all they do. I mean, there's, there's absolutely no sense that it's finished, really. And the way that particular novel is constructed is rather like a series, a series of, of short story, as I said, image complexes or situations, which, and it moves along. I think he was very opposed to the notion of linear progress, actually, which is a very, you know, it's what we handed down. It's rather a, rather a false one for the way we actually conduct our lives. Um, the idea that this produces that, produces that, produces that, produces an end. Um, I don't think you've got much time for that. So in, a, in his novels, at least, I think there's the same feeling, something very urgently underway, which in the end won't be resolved, but there will be new possibilities will have been thrown up. And it's, roughly speaking, you can, I don't mind it, one calls it redemptive in the sense that, I mean, it, I take it as just axiomatic, there are better ways of being in the world and worse. Is that not just the case? I mean, there are, there are livelier lives and less lively lives, and that's... I, you know, I'm, an, I'm an atheist, I'm an entirely secular being, but it, and perhaps that gives the urgency to it in an existentialist fashion. There are better and worse ways of being in the world, more, you know, in, in good faith or bad faith, according to me. And that seems to me what's at stake, whether you actually ever achieve a, it's inconceivable that you would achieve a situation where, where you were, as it were, redeemed. Um. Both, both those writers have another similarity in that. Um, you talked about how uh, Sherwood Anderson claimed to have never, never edited uh, Hans, never changed a single word. And, and Lawrence is a little bit like that in that he, uh, he wrote um, various novels in, in one go and then dismissed them and threw them away. There are the three way. versions of Lady Chatterley. Yeah. And uh, there are umpteen little bits of short story before he writes the, the, the Shades of Spring, which leads into Paul Morel, which leads to to um, Sons and Lovers. And these are not sort of a text that you then fiddle around with aid endlessly and see if, you know, that bit in chapter three could go or you could cut and paste it in hard days to, to chapter six. It's not like that. I mean, he sits down and, you know, he uses language which you wouldn't want to use. I mean, it's like I sit down and Pentecost blows through me again. That is to say <laughs> that I sit down and give it another go, really, from start to finish. Long novels. Um, that is odd, really. It's not, and it's not, and the, the Kafka, his breakthrough was actually in this insomniac condition. He wrote the judgment at one sitting overnight, and he speaks then, he says, on that occasion, the wound broke open. That's his, that's his understanding of this first successful fiction. And thereafter, he quite often regretted that he couldn't write the thing at a sitting. He thought that the metamorphosis was spoiled, because he had a business trip, he couldn't actually do it in one. Don't forget, he was employed in an insurance exchange. Um, he couldn't do the whole thing in one, in one go. And there's a feeling of, of it's not, you know, it, it's not um, like Yeats and, his, and that sort of writing. It's not that. It's very, very conscious. But there is the feeling that this is, you have to get through this, in, as it were, in one breath. 
So to go back to your, to your early point about the, the kind of the morality of the novel versus the short story, um, I was very interested in, in um, Bernard Malamud, um, who's a great short story writer and novelist. And, um, and weirdly, the reason why his short fiction was, I think, perhaps more successful, and, and you know, people tend to go back to the short fiction perhaps even more than the novels these days, um, because he was an unusual writer in that he, he was looking for a, a moral epiphany rather than, um, rather than an emotional one. Um, so what you'll find a lot, a lot of the time in the short, short fiction is that the moment of epiphany, the kind of a snapper at the end of the story, is, it, is a moral conviction. And that's very unusual. It's a very unusual modern, uh, as, a, as a modern writer, to, to come up with. And, and I think that one of the things which short fiction can do uh, perhaps in a more subtle way is, is have that moral epiphany rather than have to go 300 pages to get to that moral epiphany and then for people to go well actually that's not my moral com to, or my moral compass and therefore I reject this novel wholeheartedly you know it's a it's a it's a different thing I mean you could imagine right reading I don't know some of the moral epiphany that that's like any, any of the Ayn Rand stuff and reading that in a short story and thinking oh well I'm glad that i understand that kind of that sense of morality I having to read the fountainhead for all oh, 800 pages just to realize that you fundamentally disagree on every single level with this book is, is a different kind of thing so i think I, I do think that there is a an intriguing way of getting of getting a, a moral point out in a short story that doesn't necessarily come across like a parable or doesn't necessarily come across like being browbeaten um for you know like a like an oliver stone movie for however long would you mind if I ask about consciousness? Yeah, we need to we need to throw it open to, um, to you guys because I could chat all, all day. Just before, I would like to know, honestly, to know what you think. But what, I, I put it very modelly. What I don't mean after the war, Lawrence, all his fiction, all of his fiction, really, in some way or other, had to do with the war. And an awful lot of characters come back very broken from the war, and he writes about the after effects. Um, if he'd lived till thirty three and beyond, then there's this terrible feeling that you would never catch up, actually. You would never, ever catch up. Now, I really want to know. I don't mean that every single thing we write should in some way, tangentially or not, deal with the latest atrocity in Paris or deal with, you know, we're, we're up to there in it now. There's not much, we're, we, you know, we're almost drowning in it. I don't mean that. I, I think I, what I mean is that every single thing that you write, is, is in a, that is its actual context. And it will have its effect in, the con in a context of, well, take ISIS as a good example. What ISIS wants to do is reduce the whole world and everybody in it to binary opposite. <laughs> that is, you're either with us or you're not with us. And if you're not with us, we will exterminate you. There's absolutely no, there's no idea that as, uh, uh, as, um, uh, as frequently said, you know, the world is actually a, a, a McNeese. Um, world is plural. I mean, that's, that's his basic... Tenet, and it's the tenet of poetry, and it's the tenet of fiction. To somebody like ISIS, to any sort of fascism, the world is not in the least plural. It's a mad purism in Hitler and in the rest of the gang that have followed since, actually to reduce everything. So if you write fiction in which there is this insistence on plurality, which I take it is what your reading of that is, I mean, we're not, we're not saying it, that equals that, that is why they loathe it, because it, it's not binary. And the risk for us in the West is that we can, that from now on we exist as the binary opposite of this thing which we now have no obligation, but no option but to contest. Which means to say that if we don't watch it, our whole way of being is merely reactive to something which is savagely bent on, on exterminating us. And that's no good either. You want a massive space in which you are at liberty to be plural. Now, that's what I mean by consciousness, really, is, is an endless keeping open of, of, of opposites in a context, particularly in our day and age, whose, whose tenet in life is that there is no such thing as plurality. So, tell me what you think. Mm -hmm. It's a, a particular definition of consciousness, isn't it? When I say consciousness, what is consciousness? It's seeing clearly, uh, in terms of intellectually, in terms of perhaps of feeling, mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of your interpretation and, 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 and trying to cut through the fog. You know, so if you, if you go back to, I don't know, uh, you know Buddhism, you know, the Four Noble Truths, everything is suffering, 
God of supreme desire, you know, to translate that into fear and ambition, so we can see clearly, feel clearly, without seeing, without being dis the distortions of fear and ambition, which manifests in ISIS in the kind of the division that you speak of, the Dar al Haab, the world of war, and the Dar al Salam, the world of Islam, which is the world of peace. That's the only peace. The rest of the world is war. The house of Islam, the house of peace. If you can see clearly through those things, then you get consciousness. The paradox of that that I see is, is this. When you, when you feel that you've achieved that clarity through consciousness, that you're, seeing, that you're not seeing through a fog, and that implies action. Because you've reached the position that you think is a definitive understanding. And that action may have gone to divine. Are you saying that you reach a sort yeah, of... Yeah, I think your clarity, when you, find, when, when you see with consciousness, when you see, when, when you believe that you, 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 you've got to a position where you've kind of cut through the veil, yeah. uh, then you reach a place where you, where you, where you can make this, where you can uh, come to a, 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 a decisive know, ideological if you want, make, make a decision based on the position that you're in. That's, that's, what, that's where Lawrence was, do you think? Well, I don't think he, I mean, even if that were... His intention on some level, he had, in my view, manifestly never got there. But because circumstances change, it's like perpetual revolution because the circumstances around you, uh, you know, it's more Trotskyist than the monolithic Marxist on this, if it's got a political equivalent. It is that circumstances change and your thinking is unfitted, you know, almost not quite day by day, but certainly in the course of, of life, if you. This is the good thing about fiction, really, why we can still read it from a lot, because the basic sort of um, thrust of it is, is the uncertainty, is the trying to arrive at a consciousness apt to where you are now, mm. which means you can read things from, you know, you can read Homer, you can read things through the 19th century and still, because we, our consciousness is manifestly different. I mean, the, let's put it differently. The, the data of our consciousness are now other. And at the minute, they're particularly terrible and threaten to be overwhelming. It's, it's very difficult, though, to, to not, if you try and uh, stand kind of, uh, stand uninfluenced and stand independent from so many of these points of views, it's very difficult to not then retract into relativism. I was actually in Paris uh, yeah. two weekends ago. I was there when it was happening. And I ended up late at night, sat around a table, talking to uh, two, two people who, who, uh, who are half French and lived in France for, for many, many years. And they were talking about the attitude to, to the niqab and the, and the veil uh, in France, which is very kind of, um, it's n what, what, you're, what you're bringing here isn't free, this idea of the of the veil isn't free. It's not. It doesn't fit with our our, our consciousness. It doesn't fit with our view of the world. And if if you want to be free, you have to. You know, they they banned it in public places, etc., yeah. etc. Et but I was, there was also somebody in the in the group who was of Persian extraction who had to kind of explain politely that you know for for Persians it is a symbol against uh, the imposition of the Shah who uh, ripped uh, veils from from women and. Uh, or his his his, uh, um, his his employees his Sorry. his army did yeah it pulled and, and forced forced women into his the Shah who was a, a puppet of the American uh, the government at the time because they had assassinated Mossadegh um, it, so so they were forced into a, a Western perspective and when uh, the religious Islamic revolution happened and the Shah was overthrown the first thing everybody did was embrace this idea. Of, uh, of 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 the veil as a as a two fingers to to what America tried to do, and that obviously becomes part of a uh, of a of an argument. And I have I work with a lot of Gazan writers and I work with some Iraqi writers as well. And uh, when a Gazan writer I know walks through walks down the street in Gaza because she grew up in <laughs> Lebanon in a refugee camp in Lebanon, she might not be completely covered up. People spit it and say, "Oh, look, Tel Aviv is here," um, and they use Tel Aviv, they use Israel as a as a hatchet to throw at to throw at her for for not being their version or not uh, complying with their consciousness. And how do you how do you navigate this when if you have a, if you say you have a, an idea of a space 
even your idea of that space is it comes with a certain amount of imperialism really it comes with it's centered in your view of the world uh, and you don't understand maybe the the reasons for for people rejecting that space i mean it's it's incredibly i'm throwing the question I, so I, 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 I think i think there needs to be a distinction between perhaps the artistic imperative and the artistic consciousness versus the general consciousness of a, of a country or a kind of social set. Um, so your, your, your question about Lawrence, like would he have ever got over the First World War? Um, well, you know what, he'd have had to. Um, I mean, that's, that's, just, that's just it. But he could have kept on writing about, uh, writing about the First World War and, and the, the effects, um, and then, you know, subsequent to the Second World War as well. He could have kept doing that. But, you know, if you are, you know, from a Welsh mining village, you know, you go down the pit of a morning, you come back out, you know, um, and you don't have time or the inclination to think about, you know, anyone outside of your family or outside of your village, really, who's, you know, twitching or like Septimus after the First World War. You know, you, you just, we have an amazing capacity to carry on. But also it goes back to your breath thing about the, um, uh, about the capacity to forget. Yeah. The, reason, the reason why that he's talking about that is the, the, the ability to forget is so important, our ability to delude ourselves is so important, because otherwise we probably wouldn't have children in as many as we do. You know, if, they, if, if men... Sorry? Sorry, no. We've but, probably been wiped up. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, this is very much in my mind, because my, my wife's very heavily pregnant, and she's going to give birth for, for our second child. And, you know, we joke about this, because she's like, you know, I don't remember anything about that. I don't remember the pain. I don't remember any of that. I just, you know, I, I know it was painful, but, you know, but if you could remember all of these things, if you could remember exactly what that, and I don't remember what it was like to go without sleep for however many weeks it was, we have that ability as a human race to do that because otherwise we just can't cope. Otherwise you end up as an artistic, you know, like Thomas Hardy, for example, sitting there spending all those years writing poetry about his dead wife, what his second wife sitting there, you know, looking after him. You know, that's just not possible. <laughs> that's not possible if you work at Tesco's, you know, like that's just not going to happen. You're going to have to keep you have to keep going. I totally agree that you have yeah. to keep going. There are still better and worse ways of being in the sure. world. Sure. Mm. There definitely are. And there's a distinction between ideology and the kind of consciousness that I think what you're talking about, the world, is with, with the mercy of ideologies. And it's very important what you've just said. There's a space in which it is possible not to be... It's not an ideology. It's a, it's a testing of various ways of being human, some of which are more... Um, conducive to humanity than others. I mean, I'm asking no more than that, really, that we agree that, <laughs> and the ones on offer, or to speak on offer, being forced towards us. It's not good as we are. I mean, if you just listen to, you know, this, this Islamic State, and England is not that, but the, if you look at the consciousness or the ideology that we're fed day in, day out about strivers and skivers and all the rest of it, that is definitely an ideology, and it's, a, it's demeaning of human beings. And the whole assessment of human beings as as merely economic commodities, mercantile entities, which comes, it, it's totally pervasive. And literature and poetry offer you a way of, of you know, of, of, it's what he calls redress, of pushing back against these, these things. What you come up with yourself as practical living is up to you in every single case. But the, the, the effort of literature, I think, altogether is is the holding up of possibilities in a world which is quite often bent on reducing them to one or just a couple binary opposites because mm. you know dictators never like give prizes to you know they set, never set up literary prizes or they hate uh, it. Or, 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 or you know sort of say we will have 40 new poets by tomorrow uh, they'd have a five-year plan for you know short stories but you know it's always the first know, thing that goes it's always you know any it's a strange thing it's not strange really but nothing under national socialism in the way of literature was any good it's as easy as that what did get written in internal exile is not national socialism most of them went abroad and a lot of them committed suicide a lot, and there are certain ideologies which are which are just inimical to the whole business of being human. And if you've got one like that, Bresch says at some point that the Battle of Smolensk in 1941 is a battle for lyric poetry. Now you think, how dare this man talk about? <laughs> but actually, what he means is, it's a battle for the whole possibility, the ways of being that the lyric poem upholds as as possible, mm. and. 
you know this, I'm sure, but I'll say it you know, once again. Himmler said, we came to extirpate what the Germans called humanität, humanity. That's not the, the race, but the whole tradition of humane thinking, right through from the Renaissance, through the 18th century, and into the 19th and into the 20th. They actually had a program, just as ISIS wanted to did pull down Palmyra, they put a, a concentration camp, Buchenwald, on the hill overlooking Weimar. And Weimar is the Goethe, Schiller, humanism, all the rest of it. They hanged people from what was known as Goethe's oak tree in the camp itself. Goethe sat under that oak tree composing poems. It was a sort of national monument, really. This is a conscious effort to actually extirpate a variety of ways of being human. Oh, Churchill, Churchill did the same thing. You know, when, um, a f famous quote when he was asked about the British Library and he said, you know, we'll make sure that we'll defend it and move everything. Um, and someone was complaining about the, the amount of money or, you know, and he said, well, what's the point of winning what the war? Well, yeah, yeah. said, well, what yeah. are we fighting for? Yeah, yeah. He said, well, what are we fighting for? Exactly, and that's, yeah. And, and I, I, do, I, I, do, I, I do genuinely th think that we sometimes take literature and culture in this country far too much for granted. I think that we, we just expect it just keep going, just keep happening. Um, and um, um, we, are, we are a strange country. I always think they said, um, uh, Wodehouse said that, um, uh, that we would never have, uh, we would never tolerate a Nazi government because we'd be, take too much time um, making fun of their uniforms. Um, and that is entirely true. You know, we can't take anything too seriously in this country for any length of time without there being a joke or some form of satire about it or, or any form that will turn around and say, you know what, you're getting a bit too big for your boots, you, you know, and that, that kind of thing. I, I think that is something which, which, is, um, which is great on the one hand, it means we'll never have a fascist government, but on the, uh, on, the, on the flip side of that, it does mean that, you know, we can't revel in someone's greatness as a writer you know, um, without somehow being a bit pointed and a bit, a bit sniffy about it. I think it's a problem. It's a problem. I have a thing about satire. I, I don't actually, I actually like satire very much. I went from, from loving it as a teen and, and someone in my twenties. And then I suddenly fell out of love very, very violently with satire because um, I began to think of it as um, a crowd of people pointing and then more and more people getting behind the person pointing. Um, and going, we're in on the joke, ha, ha, ha. And actually, in terms of novels, and a lot of the stuff which has been put forward as really great novels um, in the latter part of the 20th century and, and the early part of this century, um, are considered to be great social satires and wonderful satires. And they're, they're just the easiest targets in the world. I mean, you know, if you want to satirise middle-class life, just go to Shoreditch, you know? Like, you don't have to, you, you, you don't have to go and read a 900-page book satirize the middle classes you just don't need to do it and who's reading that book it's the middle classes because we you know the middle classes like to laugh at themselves like to see them their own ridiculous nature reflected in it as a kind of active middle class kind of self-reflexive um uh, you know being bashed around that you know um i can't remember the word word isn't escaping me but um but yeah we just like to bash ourselves in, in that kind of way and and then this has been escalated by the kind, the kind of the the internet 2.0, the web 2.0, which has allowed people to, whenever anybody does have any success, just to be absolutely slammed, even when they when when they've done something really great. So Marlon James, for example, you know, really worthy winner of the Booker Prize this year, like genuinely a really worth, a worthy winner, a really good book, really interesting, written really in a really interesting, unusual way, innovative. And the first question, the first comment below the line on the day of the Booker Prize win was someone saying, oh, it's political correctness gone mad because the guy's Jamaican. You know, and you just kind of think, what's the point? And we're talking about consciousness now. The internet is a consciousness all of its own, and that's a pretty dirty, depraved, sewer-like place. And that's a... Um, um, perhaps a different discussion, but it is, yeah. it is definitely a, it's definitely a part. It of has that. changed. You're quite right. I mean, the internet makes it. It is a sort of consciousness. It's a very, very bizarre one as well. And I'm not sure what Lawrence or what the writers price that would would have made of it. I mean, I just don't know. No. Another flip side to the um, another part of that flip side to Woodhouse's comment is that um, if our politicians can be shown to have a sense of humour, they're they're kind of uh, invulnerable. So we yeah. have but we have monsters like Boris Johnson who who can do no wrong, 
because he has great comic timing. Yeah. Um, and that's and that, and that is that is one of the, the the most dangerous dangerous things is when you can you can look at someone and go you know I really don't like their policies but phew, he's a funny guy isn't he yeah. he's funny um, and you know the, that is a, that is a that is a difference I think where we have got to a point it's a bit like the a bit like Sherwood Anderson with on, on what's on the surface and what's underneath is that we're very easy to go on what's on the surface. And I don't think we've got the time or perhaps the inclination to actually go into what's going underneath that sentence or what's underneath that that face and that visage. Um, and I think I think that's a that's a that's a, a weird thing because we've got more information than we've ever had at our fingertips. I can you know how many how many things that I could read about the opinions could I read about the bombing in Syria? You know I could I could you know, from start from the start of the day to the end of the day I could read constantly. And still not know what the what the what I'm supposed to think, what my actual real opinion is. I'm not, and but and I think that's one of the issues that we have is that we we just um, we don't we don't get to the to the nub of it. I, I'm fond of saying that we live in post factual times. Um, it's just all opinion. Um, and while I don't think that things have radically changed so much, it's just the, the you know the, the web does allow you to genuinely think. Well, I don't know anything. You know, I just you know I listen to people and I, I just I don't know. I don't know. Whether Man City are top of the league, you know, by, you know, if you take into account this and blah blah blah, you know, the, the, all these things which feel feel like absolute certainties are not there. And I think that that uncertain uncertainty of our times does lead us to look for for very obvious certainties. And I think that's not always necessarily a, a good thing. N Nietzsche distinguishes between what he calls mere knowledge about <laughs> and then what matters. And the, we now live in this world of mere knowledge about, just by going th yeah. you know, two clicks, and you've got mere knowledge about absolutely anything, and in whatever shed loads of it you, 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 wish, you wish to look at. But mere knowledge about, reines wissen um, and he's absolutely contemptuous of that. It doesn't amount to anything. It doesn't actually touch you. It doesn't affect the way you live. It's just stuff that you accumulate. He had in mind these colossal, great, positivistic, biographies that got going in the 19th century, colossal, you know, 500 page biographies, where you thought you'd got hold of a life by assembling, you know, then without the internet clearly, but just 30 years of work assembling all the facts of it. And Nietzsche said you ought to be able to resume the life of a great person in three anecdotes, and by which he meant sort of three luminous things which would sort of crystallize what the, what the, the spirit of this person was like and perhaps the progress through his or her life. The opposite thing is this mere knowledge about now <laughs> to to a to to a power that is absolutely was absolutely inconceivable when when the assembling of knowledge was a lifetime business and it's something that's well, clearly we've got to watch. Another thing we always have to watch is the time. Oh, uh, I, I'm afraid we've completely run out of time. We've gone way over. Um, it's amazing what a conversation about Sherwood Anderson and uh, the H elements can lead you to discuss. But that's that was the that was the intention. Uh, so um, please join me in thanking uh, David and Stuart for an amazing talk.